Namaste. So we've reached a point in chapter four of Mandukya Upanishad where the theme has been pretty well announced. Huh? The idea that causality itself has to be transcended. So what does that mean? It means to understand Brahman, to understand the self, we have to give up being the cause, being the doer, the agent, the guy who gets stuff done. Okay? <laughs> we have to actually enter causelessness. See, this is a big deal because up until this time, doing sadhana, we've always been taught you have to do meditation. You have to concentrate your mind. You have to do this and do that. Now we're reaching a point where, okay, the ultimate has been, let's say, touched, but it hasn't been embraced fully. It hasn't been fully internalized. We've gotten to the point where we know what the absolute is, we know where it is, we know what it's like. Huh? It's situated in the small space within the heart, and we know that it has no qualities, no actions, no consciousness, etc. Non-perception, non-doing, non-agentship. So if we want to realize this, which after all is what it's all about, right? That means we have to drop doing. That is the sadhana, that is the training that leads to the realization of Brahman, as it is, not as we would like it to be, not as it's cracked up to be, not as it's described in the stories of various sectarian schools, because remember, they're biased towards perpetuating their organizations. But as described in the scriptures themselves, because their motives are pure. They are without exploitation, without oppression, without discrimination as to who can and cannot read them or manipulate their techniques to gain some progress, some advantage in spiritual life. Uh, they don't decry anybody. They don't exclude anybody. They just say that, well, for certain types of people, it's going to be tougher and take longer. But that's okay. If you are also tougher and willing to take longer, patient enough to hang in there and get her done, no matter what it takes. Persistence in this game is more valuable than brilliance. Brilliance is flashy. You know, maybe it gets the girl at the end of the day, but it doesn't get the goal because it's temporary. It's like going over the top with this passionate desire for enlightenment, burning out, crashing, right? And, and hoping that nobody notices this, right? But see, you can crash or you will crash by being compulsively causative because causation is a myth. That means you have to invent this myth about yourself, about I being the cause and being responsible and being held responsible by the karma the laws of the universe, and so on and so on. I mean, wow. I made myself a cup of Sri Lankan coffee. <laughs> Just the thing for this kind of afternoon. 
It's a gray monsoony day, and one's thoughts turn to being. And being is not doing. They are completely different. Being is one. Doing requires at least two, an agent and an object, a subject and a predicate, Brahman and the world. All of that is required for doing. And at least one of those things like doesn't exist, you know, the world, right? So we have to keep recreating and recreating this thing over and over again that I am the doer and I'm doing this and I am responsible and I am the dude and I, you know, I, 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 I. So what we have to do to get out of this is drop doing. Drop it. Everybody has at least, what, 15, 20 minutes a day to sit down and not do anything? It's a revelation. It's a revolution. To give yourself the permission that being is enough, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to produce any products. You don't have to make any progress. You know, whatever that is. <laughs> Progress toward what? We are already Brahman. We just have to realize it. And what is Brahman like? Not the cause, not the effect. See, Brahman is simply, when, when he's even aware of this, the material world, is just the witness. But actually in himself, in his native state, he's not aware of the world. That's the first thing that Mandukya Upanishad says about Brahman in the scope of Turiya, Turiya consciousness. It's not consciousness of the world. It's not consciousness of the other world. <laughs> it's not consciousness of both. And it's not consciousness of neither. Huh? It's uninferable, unobservable, uncausative, never the object etc., etc. It's out of relation with everything. So Brahman then can't or doesn't do anything. You know, maybe the whole world, you could describe it as an imagination. But whose imagination? It's our imagination when we are covered by upadis, Filters that filter out most everything that is knowable and narrows it down to like a single body and its attachments. Duh. How can we understand Brahman when we are compulsively extroverted by social convention and training and pushed by economic and social and political motivations to do more, do more with less, you know, like that. And everybody around us has expectations based on their projections of our identity, of who they think we are. Huh? And none of them actually know who we are to ourselves. So why should we do anything? You know, because it means we buy into the whole illusion. This is, I think, one of the final, if not the final obstacle on the path. You know, when you get first path, when you first see Brahman, you think, wow, this is it. And it is, but it's only a glimpse because it fades. Why does it fade? Because the upadis come back in and cover it over. It's like when you take a psychedelic. For a while, you're functioning at 150, 200 
percent or more of normal mental capacity, but then it fades. And all the things that you knew in that state, you can't even remember, isn't it? Well, the same is true of Brahman. When you're in that enlightenment experience, the path experience, you got it and you get it. You know, and you know that you know. But then over time, it again becomes covered over by the upadis, the filters, and they filter out really the good stuff. And you're just left really with a memory. Well, wow, that was great. Well, but what was it? <laughs> so if you're fortunate, you hit the books and you go in and you, you dig out the real explanation of it to the point where you can start creating it for yourself. Now, how do you do that? Well, you drop everything that's not Brahma, neti neti. And by process of elimination, you arrive at the self, yourself, the self, Brahma. They're identical. They have to be, because who else, what else could we be? Huh? So the, the bottom line here, I think I'm going to pause the Mandukya Upanishad fourth chapter series. And if I take it up later, it's going to be later on in the chapter because the next, I don't know, 20 or so shlokas really just say the same thing over and over again. They don't add anything new beyond what we analyzed in our Quadrilemma video, which you should watch. And this means that I'm going to just take a break. I'm not going to do any creative work unless I have to. That means I get an unequivocal motivation from within. That could happen tomorrow or I don't know, in a week or I don't know. But I'm going to do what I've been talking about and actually practice this state of not causing anything, you know, including thinking, right? Including any kind of words, names and forms or causes and effects identifying neither as cause nor effect, as subject nor object, but simply being and enjoying sat chit ananda, which is the real nature of the self. Om Tat Sat. <laughs> Om Shakti Om. Om Namah Shivaya.